Is this loud enough? Got it. You guys can hear me. All right. Clicker and laser pointer. I've got my toys. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, if you don't pick up on my accent, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, so I've come quite a long way. Very happy to be here in Amsterdam. Um, I'm just going to give you very briefly a little bit of background about myself just to help give some context in terms of the presentation I'm going to give you. Um, and the reason for that is because every time I get asked to speak at a conference um, on programmatic advertising, um, to people from the outset, it seems pretty, you know, standard, okay, it's a, a specific topic. Um, but to people that are involved in the industry, like myself, it's kind of like asking someone to give a talk on medicine, right? <laughs> what field of medicine? <laughs> like, what pains are you actually having? Have you got something wrong with your gut? Are you having headaches? Have you broken a leg? Um, are you just trying to see if you're wanting to go on a dieting space? There, there's a lot that's involved in that sort of aspect. So it's a very tricky topic to... Um, to talk on if I don't really have a good gauge in what the audience is um, and what you guys are looking for. So generally, it's always great when I'm like the speaker on day two because I get time to spend with you guys and try and get to know you a little bit so that the slides that I prepared, I know exactly how to curate it specific to your needs. Um, but guess what? I'm here now. I'm not coming up tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so I've managed to speak to maybe only like two or three people this morning since before coming on stage to try and engage a little bit. Um, so I just need a little bit of participation here because this is a master class. Um, I generally give workshops and training for a living. So that's part of what my consulting company does. Um, I specialize very much in the technical aspects of programmatic media buying and trading. So I'm going to give you guys a bit of an overview and explain to you a little bit of dynamics of the ecosystem and, and um, how it works. But again, I also have a tendency to get a bit too technical. So I just want by a show of hands, who here is from um, a media brand or an ad agency that buys uh, advertising or has done... I've got one hand there. There's a few more. So do you guys work in ad technologies? Do you work with media strategists and planners or campaign managers in any form? Some do? Okay, great. So we've, we've got like a few, a few here. You, you guys will probably ask me the more technical questions at the end um, as we go in. Um, but I'll try my best to do uh, sort of like the full moon approach, uh, moon earth approach of uh, programmatic advertising. So for some people in the room, uh, you might only need to understand what programmatic advertising is if you're standing on the moon and looking at Earth and it's just the blue planet, and that's all you need to know, right? <laughs> okay, that ticks your bo box in terms of the business needs that you need for this talk. Um, but if you're much more in-depth and involved in the talk, then you want to go into like a microscope, and if that's the way you need to do it, then we need to have a conversation offline, off stage, just to not overwhelm um, everyone else in the audience. Um, so yeah, my background is um, specifically in technical campaign management and ad operations. I've done a lot in terms of analyzing data, performance, marketing, and reporting in that. I've worked in ad agencies, I've worked in media publishing companies. I've been involved in putting together two programmatic tech companies based in South Africa on the tech systems. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, so you'll see, I'll kind of just sort of explain to you as we go through, and I'll tell you a little bit of stories in that, um, in terms of the landscape of what we've done. So in terms of uh, advertising and performance marketing, right, everyone has the same issue. This is a quote all the way from the 19th century, hundreds of years ago. And I think even today, a lot of people still relate to this and still realize that this is an issue that we have. Um, especially even in online and digital where, um, you know, thing, everything is supposed to be trackable. You are supposed to be able to know exactly where your money's been spent, your budget, and how it works and allocates. Um, but that's still not the case today, um, and for a variety of reasons. So hopefully I'll give you some context and uh, highlight a little bit, and yeah, we'll see. So we're going to start from the beginning, okay? I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Most of you would be familiar with the direct way of how you would buy and sell media. So it's very much the traditional way. So if you're in publishing or in TV or traditional media or radio, all right, you're an advertiser, marketer, 
you want to approach and have your ad delivered on a particular publication, you would liaise with that media publisher, right? And the two of you would negotiate a rate um, and direct, uh, transact directly uh, face to face or with each other, okay? And generally that's used uh, via an ad serving platform which the publisher would load and then implement that on their site or their page, okay? However, if you need to do that as a buyer and you're wanting to target thousands of sites or hundreds of thousands of people, you want to get a wide reach across multiple markets in multiple countries, transacting in that way isn't exactly a viable way of doing that. So as a result, ad networks came into play around the late 90s, early 2000s. And essentially, an ad network was an aggregator of unsold inventory. Okay? It was like your one-stop shop for a bulk buy. All right? Say, for example, as an individual, you want to, you're throwing a house party with your friends, so you want to go to the local grocery store. You want to buy a couple bottles of wine, you want to buy a couple snacks and stuff to, to eat, you can go to the store and you know exactly what you're doing. So you're going to transact directly. But if you're throwing a banquet and you're running a conference and you have, um, you have to throw a party across multiple countries and that, you want to kind of buy in bulk, right? So and you want to get your, your reach a lot better, and you want to be able to get a discount. So you would use the aggregated way and maybe go via a third-party wholesaler to, to do that. Okay, in case you haven't noticed, I use a lot of metaphors just to try and explain things in a non techy way, just to sort of uh, get through it. It's just one of my teaching skills, so I hope it's working. I'm really seeing some nods in the, in the audience. So that's essentially what an ad network is, okay? They're aggregated unsold ad inventory, okay? But this, what this ended up meaning is that the publishers and the advertisers uh, were no longer engaging directly. All right? The advertiser would go to the ad network and say, I want to reach a wide audience, I want to get a lot of inventory. Um, it's, it was pretty much dubbed the spray and pray approach of advertising. All right? You didn't necessarily know where your ads were being displayed. So you had issues about viewability or, again, coming to the quote, half the ad spend that you were buying on an ad network was wasted, but you didn't know which half. But it was okay, because media buyers and agencies were like, we got the inventory for quite cheap, so we can offset it. And as long as our conversion rates that we get at the end of the day um, make up for it, we can continue to buy that way. Um, but that buying model was pretty much short-lived, and then, then came in the ad exchanges and server-side platforms. And essentially, not to get too complicated into it, basically, it was an upgraded version of an ad network. All right? This was also the birth of when programmatic advertising came into place, where you could start bidding for inventory, and you could start targeting. And it also gave publishers a lot more control, because now they're able to control who has access. They could start blocking um, unwanted ads, or they could make their inventory uh, sort of set a floor price and say, I, I'm not willing to open up my unsold inventory for someone to buy it for like five cents a click. All right, they would set like a floor price and that's what they would use the technology known as the supply side platform for. Then you kind of move up a little bit more into terms of the demand side platforms, which is uh, the flip side of the coin, but for the buyer's perspective. So you would almost be using the same program as what the supplier would use and the buyer just has extra functionality where they can manage multiple campaigns um, and run uh, their budgets and that across multiple suppliers. This, this space still only kind of helped tick the box of improving the mass bulk purchasing of the spray and pray approach of advertising. It still didn't help or make it easier for an advertiser to liaise directly with a publisher um, to buy um, and trade media online, um, they would still have to do the traditional 1990s way of buying and selling advertising, where you'd have to speak to the publisher directly, let the publisher load the ad on their ad serving platform and send you the reports. So now we've kind of evolved into the stage where you've got your private exchanges um, and your automated guaranteed deals. Uh, it's also known as private marketplaces. I've got a slide that I'll show you that um, a little bit later. Um, but finally, we're, we're in an environment now, and it's still relatively new. I often like to say uh, that the digital marketing and media trading ecosystem that we're in today is still kind of like in its teen phase. It's only been around for about 10, 15 years, and the 
programmatic, uh, guaranteed private exchange buying model has only been around for po possibly the past five or six years. So again, depending on what markets that you're wanting to run your campaign in and target, you've also got to be aware of whether that supply is available programmatically or not. You might find yourself in a position, especially if you as a media buyer or an advertiser is wanting to target a niche audience in a specific market, that might not be available programmatic. So you would still need to go the old school 1990s way of, of buying and selling media. I know you guys just saw this slide before. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> this is the slide that makes your eyes bleed. And yes, it's always good just to sort of drive the message home a little bit. Um, I think he might have shown you this slide as well. Um, if not, uh, just to sort of put things into perspective of how young our industry is. Okay, just eight years ago, there were only 150 companies in ad tech. All right, today alone, it's 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 um, expanded and it's evolved at an rap incredibly rapid rate. And just in the display and programmatic advertising space, which is the technologies that I've been working on for the past 10 years, there's now almost over 200 companies that they were in. So again, even early on in my career, there were probably only, literally I could count on one hand how many programmatic advertising technology platforms there were. And I'll fast forward eight years and there's 200. So it's a very difficult market to navigate through if, you, if you're not intimately involved in this landscape and this ecosystem. For you as a business owner that's trying to explore how you're going to navigate or how you want to implement a programmatic strategy, you need to think about what technologies you're wanting to use. But now how are you going to navigate through 7,000 plus technologies and what to use, right? So again, that's why. Shameless plug, consulting companies such as myself help you navigate through this stuff because we've been there and done that and we've got the scars to prove it. And what I mean by that is, to give you an example, a previous company that I worked with, um, we were a programmatic um, startup and it was invested by um, one of the largest media publishing companies in South Africa. They, are in, they come from the traditional radio um, background space. So they've got like three or four of the major radio stations in the country. But now they also have websites to it as well because they need to engage their audiences both online and on radio. So what they decided is they could see that the trends are now evolving into the programmatic space. They invested in a programmatic uh, private ma marketplace startup and employee number one standing on stage before you here. <laughs> um, so what we had to do is we had to sort of find out what what the best technologies are out there. Um, and in terms of, from an affordability perspective, and in terms of an inventory and a supply and a demand perspective, uh, these are all major factors that you need to consider um, when, when building up um, a programmatic environment in a new market. And one of the things that we realized is we, we chose a, a, a tech platform, and one of the things I noticed was that I could see that the, the directors, uh, the board directors were leaning towards choosing a programmatic technology just to stand up because they realized all the competitors were using the same tech. So they thought that that, that that would set them apart, which is fine, it's a good strategy in place, but it's not the be all and end all. And what we didn't realize halfway through is when we had to use a data management platform and a supply side platform, these two technologies weren't necessarily speaking to each other very well. So we had a lot of technical integration issues that set the progress of the business um, uh, back quite a, quite a bit. So there were like a lot of delays, which can be very costly for companies. So that's just one example of what you need to be mindful of and consider if you're going into the business and you need to explore and navigate through this very saturated um, tech market. All these companies have their unique value propositions that they're in. It's up to you to try and find out which ones. But again, if you want to go and try and connect with several dozen different tech companies and find out which technologies, it, it can be quite a time consuming process. So again, you know, sometimes it helps that you get a consulting firm that actually knows the space and then can help you navigate through that a little bit quicker, saves you a lot of time and money. So in terms of the ad tech landscape, all right, most of those ad technology platforms have evolved, okay, to meet the needs of the advertisers, not necessarily the publishers. So, so we've often found ourselves in a situation where many publishers 
um, are lagging behind in terms of making the inventory available to meet the needs of what the advertisers need. Okay, um, And what this means for you as a marketer, if you're wanting to target um, a certain publisher or a publisher that has a niche audience that suits your brand or your marketing objectives, is um, internationally brands are giving various ad agencies mandates that they need to spend X amount of their budget and ad spend needs to be done programmatically. It's almost like a bullying technique that's gone in for, for a multitude of reasons, most, mostly for, for targeting performance and transparency to actually know where to address that spray and pray approach of like, where's the other half of my ad spend being, um, my budget being spent and what's working. Um, but what a lot of people don't consider is that, you know, a lot of the publishers are not available in that programmatic environment. Um, so there's, there's been a disconnect where I would go as far as to say, and maybe it's even something um, contradictory, um, uh, but it's more just for the purpose to help you out anyway, that programmatic advertising is not the be all and the end all. It is definitely a useful and unique component, but depending how you implement it in your strategy, you would obviously ask yourself the question, what is the best audience? How can I track and find my customer? Where are they and how can I get it? Is the tech available for me to do it programmatically? If the tech is not available to do it programmatically, then you might need to consider liaising in the old school way of, of buying and selling media, um, mostly because the publishers um, are not available in, in that environment for you to, to transact with. So another sort of uh, infographic or slide just to help put things into perspective. We all understand the advertiser and the publisher of how they've transacted and how they um, sort of buy and sell media online. Uh, again, the ad networks came into play as a third party aggregator. What this meant is that the advertiser is communicating with the ad network and the publisher is communicating with the ad network. So they became a me middleman in the picture blocking, blocking it. And for that, there were various other issues that came about in terms of viewability or click fraud or not knowing where your ads are and lack of transparency. So then the technology got upgraded and you had an ad exchange, which was the programmatic side. So now the advertiser would work through an ad exchange in order to have more control over where they're buying it and there would be multiple ad networks within those ad exchanges that you've got. Again, the publisher and the advertiser are no longer communicating with each other. Right? There's, a, there's a disconnect, there's this middleman scenario happening. And this is only ticking the box of the environment in the open marketplace, where you buy in bulk inventory for relatively cheap rates, um, but you're getting good conversions because the technology's been upgraded to improve the performance using data technology. Um, but you're not, again, you're still not ticking that box of being able to target specific sites for specific messages that you want to get. And then the demand side platforms and the supply side platforms. So for example, um, everybody's familiar with Google, right? From the publisher side, you've got Google Ad Manager that the publishers would manage uh, campaigns and, and sort of track the various campaigns and the supply of ads coming through. And then the advertiser would have their demand sign platform, which would also be Google, which is now today known as DB360. Google's been changing their name quite a bit lately over the past years. Um, some the ad tech people in the audience should be familiar when it was still called DoubleClick. And then Google bought DoubleClick, and now they've kind of changed it to DB360. Uh, again, another very challenging thing to navigate through. <laughs> You could probably have another slide of like companies that have all that and then the companies that have changed their names and the ad agencies that have bought another ad agency and changed their names too. That's a fun market that we <laughs> work in. <laughs> but that's why I'm here to help you navigate through it. Um, and finally, you're now in a position where the demand side platforms and the supply side platforms are finally bridging the gap. The gap which allows the advertiser and the publisher to communicate directly with each other and transact directly in a programmatic environment. So you've got your ad servers, you've got your third party data providers and your data management platforms. This slide generally can take me anything up to 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on whom I'm training and how in depth and involved we get. Um, but that's not for this class. So you can just keep the slides, <laughs> have fun with that. <laughs> 
really don't want to bore you with that one. <laughs> Um, data management platforms. There's a video here, but I'm not going to play it because we don't have time. Um, if they share the decks with you, you guys can watch it in your own time. It's about four minutes long of explaining the gist of what a data management platform does and entails. But in brief, in a nutshell, it's basically what it stands for. It's a way for you to collect your data and how to manage your data for the purpose of improving your marketing campaigns or your customer relationship management. So CRM tools are also very well connected with data management platforms. You get three types of data. Your first party data, I think as most of you are all um, very much aware of, would be your personal information. And again, the previous speaker was highlighting on the complexities about this where you have to make sure it's GDPR compliant, that you're not using, I think all of us in the room are probably very familiar with the Facebook Cambridge analytical scandal. It's a little bit orkies. Um, so yeah, you make sure you got your GDPR right and that you don't piss off your, your customers and then you end up losing them. But from a marketing perspective, all right, first party data, if I'll give you an example. Uh, I flew up here yesterday via KLM Airlines. I go onto Google, searching cheap flights to Amsterdam, because obviously don't want to pay unnecessarily as a result. The search engine marketing strategists that come in, the search engine optimization comes in, it gives me all the options in the Google search. All right, I purchase uh, the tickets online. KLM now has my first party data, right? Then after I've bought my airline tickets, KLM knows when I'm flying up, how long I'm staying for, and Booking.com approaches KLM and says, we see Amanda bought an airline ticket, she needs accommodation, right? <laughs> can we buy your first party data so that we can target her with the right specific ads to help her find accommodation when she's in Amsterdam? Now you're in the second party data phase, which essentially is just buying someone else's first party data. Now remember, they're not buying my name, my contact details. They're not emailing me directly, all right? So what, what you use in terms of a data management platform is KLM would basically create a custom audience segment for Booking.com to say, we want to target these very specific ads to a consumer. Uh, say, for example, KLM will say to Booking.com, we see there's about a 20 or 30% overlap from all our, our um, audiences and our customers that are looking at booking.com. So we'll, bu we'll build a specific audience segment using our data management platforms, and you can target that audience segment. Um, and that's how you end up getting those ads every time you go on your Instagram, or you go on Google, or you're reading the latest news, and it's like, whew this specific hotel for this specific date and this specific quote has now popped up while I'm reading a blog post, <laughs> all right, of the next event or whatever article it is that I'm reading. That's basically programmatic advertising in a nutshell and the way that the data um, element uh, combines into that. Third party data, okay, these slides are terrible because these are generally the slides I do in training and workshops but not presentation, um, but I just included it because I was having a conversation um, with some gentlemen here that started talking data, so I just threw that in there. Um, but basically, third-party data, uh, for those of you, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with cookies, not the ones that you eat on the table when you're having your tea and cake, it's like your digital breadcrumbs. Okay, so the cookies is like the third-party data, it's not the personal first-party data that a marketer collects about their customers. But say, for example, Booking.com has bought first-party data from KLM. They've run the ad campaign. They can now see that Amanda's been browsing. She's been seeing our ads. She's clicked on our ads, but she still hasn't converted. So we're going to run a phase two of that campaign, and we want to retarget um, that audience using the third-party data that we've collected, right? Um, and that's basically how it sort of ties in into three different types of data. So, again, just explaining the traditional media buying process. I'll tell you a little bit of backstory in terms of my career. I started out as an online campaign, campaign manager from a media buying um, publishing company. 
and we would liaise with the various ad agencies and uh, brands direct who would want to run ads on our websites. How the process would go is the publishers would have their sales teams. They would essentially knock on the doors of the ad agencies, say, can I buy you free tickets to that soccer game? We take you out for lots of drinks. Uh, you know how the whole old school business way of my <laughs> buying works. <laughs> okay. Um, and they would pitch, and a buyer would maybe give them a brief and say, all right, I need to target this audience. This is my budget. This is my campaign. The publisher would submit a proposal and say, how's about this? And the buyer's like, nope, not quite what I'm looking for. All right, we, we revise. So this negotiation is going back and forth a couple times until the publisher finally gets what the buyer is wanting and says, all right, we've got a deal. Sign an insertion order known as an IO. Uh, again, an industry full of acronyms, so you've got to understand the different lingos languages here. I have like a seven-page glossary of just acronyms in this industry, um, and it's growing. Um, and then the I.O. is generated, which is often comes in a form of an Excel spreadsheet that highlights every line item to say, I want this 728 by 90 pixel leaderboard banner on the home page of that site. From this day to that date, it's going to buy those amount of impressions, and that's how much I'm paying. And therefore, that budget is $2,000 or euro for that campaign. Now you've got to replicate it in every single line item. So when the campaign's running, and perhaps one of the line items, that banner is not performing very well on that site, but you pull in a report and you can see that there's another banner size that's performing a little bit better on another site, you want to optimize. So now you want to shift the budgets a little bit. What happens when you have to shift that? You've got to amend the I.O. Why do you have to amend the I.O.? Because the finance team need to know where the money's being spent and who they need to pay. And that can happen back and forth a couple times. I kid you not, a very dear friend of mine from an ad agency said to me he was on revision number 43 for an ad campaign, an I.O. <laughs> it is not the most conducive way of uh, running and managing ad campaigns. But it's still very prevalent in how things are done today. Um, and so there's a couple of pros and cons in terms of uh, this traditional buying model. Uh, this also means that the control for the campaign is in, within the publisher. So the publishing companies now have entire departments, ad tech departments, that are managing ad campaigns. And I find that a little bit strange because publishing companies, their brain priorities are supposed to be investing their time and resources in content and keeping their audiences engaged. They shouldn't be investing all their time and resources in creating entire departments or sub-companies on ad tech just to get those annoying ads on their sites to keep the lights switched on. But we are in that space now. And why are we in that space? Show of hands, who of you actually pay to read an article when you go on a website? or an app. <laughs> My point exactly, you kind of need those ads. And again, the ad blocking thing, I actually did a talk a couple of years ago on ad blocking, was not the most popular person in my industry when I gave that talk because it was in front of media agencies and publishing companies. But it's a result of it not being executed correctly because it's annoying. You've got to be very mindful of the campaign and the marketing strategy, even for you as a brand, not even for publishers. All right, because you don't want your brand to be associated with, oh my gosh, yes, that annoying banner keeps popping up from that company. You work for them? Oh, that's what they're selling me? Not, not cool. And again, the previous speaker is like, you don't want to run campaigns um, in a way that creates negative user experience for a person. So it needs to be within reasons, and that's why you have campaign um, marketing strategists. So the programmatic space, in terms of, we can already see that there's fewer bubbles over here that kind of shows how the process is a bit um, more streamlined. One of the key takeouts over here on this one is to show that now the dynamics that's been changed where the buyer is submitting a proposal to the media publishers or the suppliers of inventory. So what happens is a buyer logs into their demand side platform, whether it's Google DV360 or AppNexus or Rubicon Project and a whole myriad of, of other tech companies uh, would log in. Uh, it now allows you to basically punch in your targeting parameters. So say, for example, you're Mercedes-Benz and you're wanting to get people to book a test drive on your vehicles. 
Um, you're going to punch in the targeting parameters. Mercedes-Benz in Europe want to target high-income audiences, uh, people that are uh, interested in luxury vehicles, and you punch in all the targeting parameters and up come up available um, options for packages for you to buy. So it, it basically created almost like an online shopping environment for marketers, which makes it much easier. So this is how the programmatic in industry is almost evolved in a certain way. And as a buyer, you would basically pick and choose and do your online shopping within the demand side platform and in this private marketplace, uh, this programmatic environment, and select. The publisher would then get the notification or the supplier gets a notification to say there's a buyer interested. And then the negotiations go back and forth. And instead of that death by Excel spreadsheet that gets manually updated um, over and over again, it's replaced with a unique deal ID. So as soon as the buyer and the publisher agree on terms and says, right, you have a deal, the publisher grants access, the buyer gets a unique deal ID. And that deal ID secures the transaction that the campaign can go live. And the buyer is now managing the campaign. The buyer is the one that's uploading the ads into the ad server. They're the one that's pulling the reports. They're the ones that's optimizing and changing. The publisher doesn't need to do that anymore. And the deal ID and the beauty about programmatic is it automatically updates for it. So when it comes from a financial perspective, um, in terms of uh, the campaign's ended and now the finance department need to know who to pay, allocate. So initially, you know, the campaign would have started where you allocated 20% of your budget to supplier A, 30% of your budget to supplier B or C. Um, and now at the end of the campaign, the, the dynamics have changed. And this is the reason why the traditional IO buying process was so critical, because the finance teams needed to make sure that they were paying the right amounts and know where the budget was being allocated. So now with the beauty of programmatic advertising, if, it's a big if, is if your financial <laughs> um, uh, departments have the right technologies and it's integrated within the programmatic ad buying tech, then all they can do is pull the reports as well. So essentially what I'm trying to do is paint a picture here of how programmatic advertising has evolved and how it should be working for you as a marketer to make life easier on how you're transacting, how you're buying media online, and how you're dealing with suppliers. We've still got a long way off um, on that, but yeah. So how am I doing for time? I haven't even looked. I think I'm doing quite fast. Yeah? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> So uh, repetition is key, I guess. So generally, I kind of explain the same thing over and over a little bit, um, but it helps you kind of learn and pa paints a different picture. So this is basically one sort of screen or infographic that kind of helps highlight the sort of the programmatic marketplace environment on how deals are transacted and how advertising is being bought. All right, you've got your advertiser, they have the ad agencies, they have their trading desks where they allocate their budgets and plug it into their demand side platforms. Various ad exchanges are involved that are aggregating inventory. You've got your audiences, so your publishers are now using data management platforms because now the industry has evolved where the advertisers are not really um, concerned about what site uh, their ad is being placed on and where on the site it's being placed on, they're more concerned about are they targeting the right audience. Um, so again, from Mercedes-Benz perspective, Mercedes-Benz, you want to run an ad on a uh, car magazine website. Um, you're placing it there because you're only thinking contextually and you're assuming that everyone visiting that website and reading those articles is interested in booking a test drive with your vehicle. It's not necessarily the case, right? So that's why you would use the data management platform. So you would rather be interested in targeting an audience, right? That you know using data technology and data analysis to build those audience segments regardless of where that audience is. So yes, I might be on a website reading up about the latest cars, but it doesn't necessarily mean I can afford it. You know, I might be thinking, oh, okay, one day that will be my dream car. So the data management platform knows if they've got the right first party and second party data in place, 
not to allocate so much budget on spending and targeting an ad to Amanda if she's not within that target bracket to afford that car, rather allocate the budget to an audience um, uh, that has shown and that has information that it is with, within the right budgets or targeting parameters. Um, yeah, so that's that one. Private marketplaces, I think I mentioned it briefly um, in passing. So a private marketplace is just coming down to the scenario of, again, not all publishers are in a position to make the inventory available in a programmatic environment. Um, so they don't necessarily have the tech or the resources. The technologies can be quite expensive. Um, sometimes the juice ain't worth the squeeze for the publishers to invest in all this time and resources to do so. So what's happened is you've got third-party media companies that have kind of um, created businesses where they aggregate uh, sort of multiple sites and that just to make the buying process easier for, for advertisers as well uh, to purchase and, and buy audiences within those marketplaces. Um, another way for you to describe a private not marketplace would almost be uh, you need to be invited in and have a seat at the table, per se, uh, to be able to access that inventory and access the, those audiences. So the private marketplace in relation to the open marketplace, so perhaps some of you are familiar with the open RTB, so if you're not, you're going to be now when you, anyone has done Google Ads and you've wanted to run an ad across Google, that's an open marketplace. You basically just allocated a budget, you set your targeting, and now your ads are going to be running across thousands of sites uh, in whatever markets that you're doing. Right? That's the open marketplace, and you're bidding for that. Private marketplace would be that you're wanting to target a very unique set of publishers, like key premium, premium publications. And from that perspective, again, if you need to now go and find each and every single one, it makes it easier if you sort of aggregate. So an example of one of the first and earlier stage private marketplaces was a European-based company called Pangea Alliance. I don't know if that name rings a bell to anyone in the audience, but the Pangea Alliance was basically a new organization that was created, backed by uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, BBC, and I forget what the, the fourth company was. Oh, I thought it was the fourth one. Hey? Yeah? And The Guardian. So The Guardian. So there were these four publishing companies that uh, basically banded and created a private marketplace alliance where would aggregate their inventory together using a data management platform to build out audience segments so that the ad, the ad agencies and the media buyers would target the audiences programmatically the ads would be allocated across those four sites or those four publication companies um, and then do the, the performance marketing um, in, in that way. Um, so it just made it an easier process both for the suppliers and the buyers to be able to, to transact um, at scale. So that's just one example in terms of the, the private marketplaces. So I'm almost finished with my presentation. I think I'm kind of a little bit <laughs> ahead here. I hope I get brownie points <laughs> or not. <laughs> um, but you're probably thinking of a programmatic buying strategy. I've kind of highlighted and spoken quite a bit in terms of the landscape and the ecosystem and a little bit high level technicalities of how the systems and technologies work. Uh, also in terms of how the media buying agencies and the brands and the publishers direct are working, so a little bit of the whole industry landscape. But you're asking yourself the question, all right, how would you want to, what sort of programmatic buying strategy should you use? So I'm not really a fan of kind of putting a blanket statement. It's all very unique case in point. Um, but the closest I would be able to do it is if you're looking at an open auction, all right, so if you're just wanting to run ads across thousands of sites and publications and targeting, generally it's quite useful um, if you are not too particular about what sites or what publishers that you're working with. Um, it's available for all buyers, so everyone has access, both on the supply and the buy side, to the, open, the programmatic open auction environment. 
Um, and it's quite useful as a marketer if you're wanting to generate leads. So say, for example, you have a new product or you're a relatively new business and you need to get awareness out there and you need to kind of grow an audience base, you would use the open auction um, programmatic environment in which to do so because it's quite affordable um, and the targeting capabilities are quite, are quite extensive on that one. Um, if you were to do the private auction, this is kind of going into the private marketplace um, scenario that I explained to you. Um, that's basically if you're wanting to liaise and buy inventory with one particular publisher because you understand their audience. Again, this is very useful for um, companies or marketers that have a very unique value proposition, have a very unique product that they have and are wanting to target a very niche specific audience. So I've, I would say it, it's quite useful from a B2B marketing perspective. Um, so LinkedIn is a prime example from a B2B perspective. It still gives you that wide reach, um, but then you could negotiate directly you know, with LinkedIn. Um, if they approach you, you're a selected buyer um, and you could basically bid on inventory in order to target their audiences. Preferred deals um, is also within the private marketplace environment where it would be a fixed fee. So you would now be negotiating a rate directly with the publisher um, to say, if you give me, if I give you X amount of budget, will you guarantee me that I can uh, run my ads across your sites and your platforms for this long and for this rate? Um, so that's generally a one buyer to one pu publisher scenario in terms of a preferred deal um, on the private programmatic buying strategies. Uh, and then as I'm ending off, before we go into questions, uh, programmatic is not just digital online on webs and mobile applications, all right? Programmatic is essentially automating the way media is bought and sold. Okay, so programmatic is now being done in out-of-home billboards. So even your traditional billboard advertising has now become digital. And this scenario here with um, Kylie skincare range, there was a launch. And within one day, they managed to target uh, her ads with like a whole sponsorship takeover across the entire United States. This campaign was launched where these billboards were displayed at the same time within probably about half a day. So within just a few hours within a day, these billboard ads basically did like a whole sponsorship takeover across the entire United States. Um, and that could only be done using programmatic technology. You can just imagine how you would be able to do that if you had to print it out, carve it up there. So this thing went across two and a half thousand billboards in about 25 to 45 states in America. So this is how programmatic advertising sort of comes in. It's basically using the technology to help you target at scale. Um, and programmatic audio is now also the latest trends at the moment. So I'm sure everyone in the room at least has one sort of audio tool, listening service. Um, I know I'm seriously addicted to Spotify. Cannot turn that thing off. Um, but again, so now programmatic audio, again, it's not just display banner ads, all right, that's going programmatic. You've also got your, your podcasts and your audio ads that are embedded in. So from a perspective of maybe like the traditional radio side of things, um, where the radio DJ has to announce or insert an ad um, in there that's done in the old school traditional way of how, how it's done. Now programmatically, depending on the audience listening to whatever podcast, the right ad. So say for example, I'm listening to a podcast and you're listening to the exact same podcast as I am. It doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna get the exact same ad. All right, programmatic advertising helps you to target it to the right audiences. So that, yeah, you've got that. So now that happens in terms of programmatic audio as well. And that's the end. I hope I've... <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? If anyone has, I don't have a... Yeah. 
Did I overwhelm you yeah. all a little bit Any too much guys? that there's no questions to ask? Oh, okay. Go on back there. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Quick question. Where do you think programmatic fits with a, with a brand or a client? So in terms of the conversations that you have with some of your clients, what are the challenges that they've got and what are the sort of difficulties that they're finding with programmatic and where, where would you put it into, a, into the marketing ecosystem? Sure, that's quite a big question. So it all depends on who the brand is. <laughs> um, thanks for the question. Um, so depending on the brand, okay, if we're looking at a, a larger brand, um, programmatic is obviously there in terms of increasing performance and transparency so that the brands can track on programmatic. Uh, where the challenge comes in is again in terms of the ad tech that you're using. So if you as a brand have a programmatic, um, are implementing programmatic and want to improve the performance of your campaigns and your marketing strategies, improve, improve your customer base, making sure that the right tech is enabled um, and that it's implemented correctly is, is vital. Um, it, I've also come across many instances, especially with uh, certain media buying agencies where they're running a programmatic campaign and say, for example, the whole purpose of the campaign strategy was to uh, generate sales leads, um, but they forgot to implement the tracking pixel to actually see how many sales leads they were getting is quite crucial. <laughs> That's happened many times. <laughs> so little things like that is, you know, don't forget the tracking, guys. <laughs> Um, otherwise, you can be using all this amazing fancy technology, but if you haven't implemented it correctly and you don't have the right skills and team members that understand the, the space, um, it could just be a very expensive ad campaign um, that you're running. <laughs> yeah. I've got, a, I've got a question. Yes. Um, what do you think the next technology is going to be to disrupt the programmatic space? I've heard mm. rumors of people using blockchain in order to kind of cut out middlemen um, mm -hmm. and just have uh, advertiser go straight to audience with programmatic ads. Um, so yeah, what do you, yeah. what do you think? So you're, you're, I think blockchain's not relevant to what you just explained there. Maybe not. Okay, no, no, no. Um, but there is, there is a blockchain element. I got that question last week as well. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll split that up into two, sp into two spaces for you. Um, already I've kind of explained that now the programmatic tech is now is able to cut out the middleman, but it only enables it for massive publishers so that have tens of millions of impressions, has an audience of tens of thousands of people that are engaging online all the time. So that's like your, your BBCs, your Wall Street Journals, your CNNs, um, your Guardians, you know, all those publications. They have very wide audiences. So they're able to programmatically um, trade their, their inventory with brands directly. They, they don't need any third parties. They've got in-house sales. But the smaller independent publishers, the more boutique ones, uh, they do rely on media sales houses, which are your middlemen, um, to help represent and, and sell for them on that space. Uh, where the blockchain thing comes in t um, into space is uh, so, so blockchain is obviously, you know, on a decentralized system. It's not being controlled by one organization that has access to it. So perhaps where the disruptive element is coming in from a blockchain perspective is that, you know, the ad tech that you're using, whether it be AppNexus or Google's tech, means they're the ones in control. They're the ones that are controlling the advertising. You're using their tech. So they're calling the shots, right? Um, and this is also the situation where, why we're in, in a state of a duopoly where the Googles and the Facebooks are dominating. About 80% of all programmatic media that is being bought is via Google and Facebook. You forget, forget Facebook owns Instagram, they own WhatsApp, um, and Google owns YouTube. Um, and they also own all the, uh, they dominate the search engines and all the publishing companies are linked in there. So they're basically dominating that space. So I think maybe where the blockchain element is coming in is to almost try and see if there is a way that you can use a technology that doesn't sort of make it all go through the Googles and the Facebooks. Um, but 
there has been a, a crypto blockchain ad network that came about recently last year, mid last year. Uh, the downside is, is because the media is transacted within milliseconds in a very short space of time, blockchain requires people to mine it, which takes time and a, a huge amount of energy capacity to do so. So there's a bit of a lag. So there's a bit of a delay. So if, you know, the, the, the blockchain ad tech side of things still has a long way to come because if you're running an ad um, using the blockchain, there's about like a couple seconds delay. Um, and then what that means in the open auction programmatic environment is that the other ads are going to get there quicker and they're going to bid and you're going to miss your window. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Very good. So yeah. no, any more questions, anybody? Oh, Mike yes. Taylor. So okay. does okay. that leave an open window for ad mediators? Where do ad mediators fit in all of this? Uh, just define ad mediator for me um, as an example. Companies that will make sure that the um, ad inventory that I buy is always going to give me the best exposure for the least amount of, of money, basically mm -hmm. um, programmatically determining um, outside of kind of a traditional price floor waterfall where I'm going to get the most for my money. Okay. So you mentioned like the, the price flow waterfall structure. And, right? and that's yeah, horribly yeah. inefficient, right? It is. Which so is why we're going to programmatic yes. ad placement. Does, yes. that, does that make the role of an ad mediator obsolete? No, I wouldn't say it does. I would say the ad mediators, are, so I kind of distinguish an ad media as more as like an industry regulator, if I'm okay to say, say that in, in the scenario. So you, you have basically, so these are the, the, the industry is sort of like, created quite a few challenges in terms of viewability and transparency and brand safety. So you would have ad mediators which have technology to help tick that box, to actually show that you as a buyer are paying a certain rate and targeting, but what's the point in paying if no one's seen your ad because your ad banner is actually being displayed right at the bottom of the, of the web page and no one's even going that far to, to scroll through the content they've already clicked. Right, so from that perspective, there's an ad media that they, they have that technology in place that actually does that scoring. And from a media buyer perspective, media ad agencies partner with those media ad, ad uh, media ad regulators <laughs> um, to make sure that their budgets are being allocated accordingly and that uh, they're, they're getting the best bang for their buck um, on that space. So from a disruptive technology, I would say perhaps maybe there would be, uh, again, you know, the Googles would probably just incorporate their own technology to sort of tick that box so that all the independent mediators become obsolete. That could be the risk in, in that scenario. Yeah. You got a question? Um. We have abandoned uh, display advertising uh, uh, because we think it harms our brand perspective uh, for okay. our, and that uh, it might hurt our uh, mm -hmm. reputation because we do not want to be displayed even though our audience is on a website uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, the platform knows he needs to see your ad. We do not want to be shown on such on, on, on dodgy websites. Mm -hmm. I am now uh, interested in the in the private uh, uh, in the private auction. Uh, um, is there some sort of checkbox which which you need to check uh, whether or not you should get involved into programmatic advertising uh, on the private auction or not? I would say the first question would be what is your budget, right? So again, making use of the technology. Are you from a brand direct? Yes. What is your brand? Uh, well, we're, we're in a niche, so yeah. uh, in the niche where we're in, it's, it's a, it's a high-end brand, but mm -hmm. it's, it's for most people, they have never heard of it. So okay. it's, it's for, but architects and, and interior designers might. Okay. So what I'm interested in is, is like uh, um, um, programmatic advertising. What I would really find awesome is that our uh, banners could be displayed on billboards mm. in front of architecture agencies, for mm. instance or on gotcha. uh, major ar architects uh, uh, online mm -hmm. uh, magazines. I've not really investigated this okay. uh, subject, but I'm, I'm 
this really uh, sparked my my, my my advice to you on that one would be, you know, depending on your budget and if you're quite a small niche 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 brand and business and you're obviously targeting a very specific niche audience, um, you're not exactly like a global brand. So there's obviously a specific market, whether it's just a regional market or a market just in one country. Um, well, we, we you are wanting global. To expand? No, you are we, global. We are, yeah, we're global. Okay, you uh, are global. Yeah, and, and uh, okay. our uh, regular advertisement goes, I believe, in some, yeah. like 190 countries. Okay. So, and we have uh, we, we sell globally. So, so that's why I think maybe programmatic advertising could be interesting. Uh, Definitely. Um, but just not on dodgy websites. It needs. <laughs> we to, want it's to how be, it's executed, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's it's a type of programmatic advertising that you would use. Yeah. So search engine optimization, uh, search engine marketing. These are all forms of programmatic advertising, right? You're running a campaign on Facebook, it's programmatic advertising because you're using Facebook's programmatic ad technology and data management tools, audience, Facebook's audience insights. These are all programmatic technologies. So I, I wouldn't get too caught up in saying we need to figure out a programmatic strategy. I would rather ask, like, say, suggest that you ask the question, what is the best way in order for us to target yeah. our audience? So you almost like make a checklist for yourself. Yeah. All right, and then when you're going through that checklist, then it'll be easier for you to realize what sort of programmatic advertising strategy to use based on your business needs. It might mean that the best way for you to generate those leads is just Google search. You know, it might mean that the best way for you to generate those leads is via connecting um, on specific forums or blog sites with niche publications across the world. Then you would need to go into uh, you know discussions with them. Um, if it's from a position within your company where maybe you have a specialist marketing department in your company that manages all those sort of things, then it would be advisable that they kind of almost go on skills development training because you can see how this industry has evolved at such a rapid pace. Uh, they might be a bit behind in terms of their marketing strategy that, that they're doing. If you don't have that, then it might also be even useful that you look at employing a specialist performance marketing agency to do this on your behalf. So you as a brand would just give them a brief and say to them, this is my budget, these are my targets that I need, this is the type of audience, and let that marketing agency come back to you with a strategy and a proposal to say to you, okay, look, we, we recommend uh, doing this sort of social media element or working with these companies. You yeah. almost outsource it to them. Well, yeah. this really, really bridges this talk between the previous talk, uh, yes. where Janik uh, told us about uh, how to uh, uh, gain experience on multiple levels. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, I have uh, uh, my assignment that Janik gave <laughs> us for <laughs> Monday. Uh, I've <laughs> okay. determined it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. A pleasure. Any more questions? Anybody? Now, if we will give Amanda another round of applause, that'd be. All right. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Yeah.